there was this period a few months back where most of the clips we were doing would get 11 or 8,000 or 15,000 views. And now sometimes we get 500 or 1,500, but I wouldn't say they're any worse or whatever. Does the algorithm do weird things and, and have flurries like that and then pull back? Have I broken something or, or what? <laughs> James Schramko here. Welcome back to my podcast. This is episode 1037. Today we're talking about Instagram and social media. And to do that, we've invited Brittany Worthington. Welcome to the call. Thanks, James. Now you go by a code name as well. You've got this whole Britify language. The social Britify is your website, uh, .com. And uh, also it appears that you'll set up your Instagram under that brand name. Mm -hmm. It's one of those situations where it was coming up with my business name at like 2am when I kind of had the click to actually, I was like, maybe I, I need to kind of make this official. Um, and it's a name that actually my mum came up with. Um, so I was playing with the social butterfly, but not being very original, that was obviously taken. Um, and the term Britify was something my mum came up with when I would ever like, I would like, you know, reorganize my room in the middle of the night or reorganize the pantry for her without her asking. Um, she said, oh, you Britified it. So that's what it, where <laughs> that's where it came from. Nice. So I'm curious about that because I last year switched from a business handle to my personal name across my domain and social media platforms. One of the reasons was I felt that having a personal brand is a strong asset. It, if you have a good following or a, a strong brand, you can you can lend that personal brand towards business brands. Was there a reason you didn't choose your personal name, or maybe you did at some point, or had both? Um, no, I think I think kind of what you're saying is that we all kind of start a business and think we need to have like this business name. And I was initially starting in, in social media management, so I was trying to kind of come across as this agency where it was really just me. And while I still think the social Britify is clearly, it's a, it's a business name, I, I really still identify it with it myself. Um, I never like aligned with, you know, a, a more agency, you know, typical name. Um, so that's where I did land with social Britify because at least it still felt like it was, it was me. It was my online persona, but yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I, I get referenced as that. I get referenced as my full name, um, but I definitely, yeah, I fall into the personal brand land way more than I do the typical business way. So it's kind of more like just a stage name for your personal brand. Exactly. Yes. Which is appropriate because you are a dancer. You were dancing on cruise ships only a few years ago. And I would say you're a relative newcomer to this industry, but you've definitely got the hang of it very quickly. Yeah. I um, trained my whole life as a professional dancer. Um, that was my that was my dream, and it's actually funny. Whenever I people ask, "Why did you start a business? What's your why?" and my answer is like, "Oh, well, I, I need to get off Centrelink um, because I lost my job as a dancer in COVID. Um, obviously, cruise ships weren't the best place to be during a worldwide pandemic. So, after five years working at sea, found myself back at home um, in my childhood bedroom with my suitcases, and I couldn't get a job. I couldn't get a job at the cafe, at a retail store." I had no experience is what they kept telling me. Um, so I was basically on government payments for a long time, waiting and waiting to see if the performing world ever opened back up. And then I accidentally fell into social media. And it's actually what makes me so passionate about what I do helping people because, you know, if I can figure it out, <laughs> anyone can figure it out. I don't know. Do, do you think you had some advantages being in the performing world that you like you know what looks good and you know you've got styling and clearly when I look at your Instagram you've got definite um, style taste right I'm someone like me I need to engage people like designers to help me with things like color palettes or to to make things look a little bit neater or nicer than they would have been yeah I mean it's I will say it's come a long way when I first created it it wasn't that aesthetic I think I've, I've I've definitely also engaged in professionals as well to help me but I, I do think one of my strengths is creativity performance camera confidence but everyone has their own strengths in some area and that's why I love people helping them to really lean into what it is they're already naturally good at and using that 
throughout their strategy because that's what you'll be known for, remembered for, um, and that's where you can really make a lot of impact. And that's what I've done with my personal brand. That's what people recognize me for. So that's what I encourage others to do as well. And what kind of brands or profiles do you work with? Is, is this all about handbags and makeup and beauty products or does this also apply to boring business products like pay-per-click agencies or search engine optimizers, et cetera? Oh, yeah. The boring, the boring are the better. Um, well, actually, when when I was doing full time social media management, a lot of my I personally liked to work with clients and businesses that I kind of felt like a customer of, and that's how I kind of got really good at it because I was like, "Oh, I'm your audience. What would what I want to see? What would you know work on me?" Um, but as I move into more consulting, coaching, um, it's you know a really vast array of businesses, mostly service online businesses. Um, but yeah, it doesn't really matter if you're boring and you hide behind a computer, you can still have an engaging and interesting online presence, whether that's your face is everywhere or your face is hot, you know, nowhere to be seen. Um, again, it's all about leaning into those strengths. Yeah, I'm going to ask you a few tips on that for myself. I'm, I'm really curious about this because actually of all the platforms, Instagram is the one I enjoy the most as a consumer. And it's the one that I'm most hands on with, where it's my team will populate the other platforms like LinkedIn or X slash Twitter, whatever they call it these days. I am interested as a consumer in YouTube and I'm starting to post there more. But it does seem like the platforms seem to borrow slash steal ideas from each other. It's, it's like as a longer term user of Instagram, I've noticed when they bring in new things like reels or stories, there was that IGTV, should we not talk about that anymore? <laughs> um, when another platform's going well with something, whether it's Snapchat or TikTok, that then seems like Instagram's fairly quick to follow, and then the other platforms, are, you know, like YouTube's involving short content. Have we seen a whole revolution in terms of short video content? Is that a big play now? For sure. There's. I think it's obviously when COVID hit. That's actually when Reels launched in 2020, and I think it was like the perfect storm of we've all got a lot of time on our hands. And Instagram, obviously swiping from TikTok, installs this, you know, I don't know, I call them like those, it's like those gambling machines where you pull the lever down, just watch all this content fly past you. It's just, it's what we wanted it's what, as, and we as in consumers wanted. And it's, it's just really snowballed even further. We have short form content across all different platforms. And then what I actually love about Instagram, while yes, it's kind of known for being a bit of a copycat. It really is incorporating a really diverse range of content types into one platform. And I think that's what makes it has been so powerful for me and so powerful for all business owners because you've got that short form video content, you've got the live aspect, you've got collaborations with other business owners, you've got stories, you know, stories are one of the easiest, fastest pieces of content you can create and you can do that on a daily basis. Um, so you've got that really vast array just on one platform, whereas with TikTok, it's focusing on more that specific style. YouTube does have short form content, but known for its longer form content. But Instagram really has that, you know, really mixed bag. And that's what I personally love about it. Do you use TikTok? I do. I actually really just try to use it for fun as a business owner. It's just really not where my audience are hanging out. They're using it for fun as well. It's not where they're really going to for more <laughs> Instagram tips, um, especially but yeah, I have a presence there. I think having a presence is important, but there's no point sacrificing your main platform for other platforms that your audience might not even really be looking for you on. I think that's what happened for me. I, apart from not loving TikTok's ownership and privacy policies, I, I just didn't. I just didn't get it. I don't like the TikTok. It seemed aimless and time wasty. That just the mindless scrolling. And actually, I've watched. My uh, nephews and nieces, they scroll two screens at once and it's it's like frightening. It's actually frightening to watch this and I think this is not good. And I don't think my audience are there. So I've, I'm just more interested in doing a better job with Instagram and I'd love to see if we can help me do a better job today uh, by learning some of the things that are important. So you've mentioned that it's a good mashup of the different ways we can communicate stories, reels. I mean, it started off as a picture platform is a picture still a thing 
Absolutely. And it really all comes back down to knowing your audience, knowing what they like to consume. And within your audience as well, there's going to be differences in how people love to consume your content. Some people just love my reels. Some people love my carousels. Some people probably have never read one of my captions in in their life, but they know all about me through another piece of content in a different way. So diversity is really important. Leaning into your strengths. If you love video, leaning into that. Um, If you are much more of a writer, you know, focusing your energy there and that's how you want to, you know, share your messaging. It's really important just to be diverse, but also know where your true strengths are and how you best shine and how you best can deliver the same quality you deliver in your business, but through your content, because your content really is a representation of what you're doing in the day-to-day of your business. Now, uh, it'd be good if I could just walk it back a little and we can just define what some of these things mean just to, we'll assume that we have a fairly basic knowledge, right? Let's say carousel. You said carousel. So I know what a carousel is, but I'm wondering if you can explain it because we do see this also seems pretty popular on Twitter and on LinkedIn. So they're the platforms that I'm used to seeing these things. And of course, Instagram, how would you describe a carousel? Well, a carousel, you might call it like a swipey post. Um, There's, you know, lots of different nicknames for it, but it's essentially more than one static post um, in one post. Um, You can post up to 10 um, in one. You can now include video elements, um, but you can either do photos or you could do graphic images that you've created in a program such as Canva. And why I feel they're so powerful, if, if you are someone that's naturally a writer, that's how you love to share you can get all of that value that you would normally have kind of hidden in a caption because someone actually has to click to open that caption. You can get all of that out into the main visual component of the post. Um, So it's a lot harder for people to ignore. So generally it's a few, you know, between like five to 10 slides of paragraphs, more brief than maybe, you know, a blog post or an email, but it's one of the, you know, most common types of content people to save, to share, Um, And you can get your branding in there as well. So it's great for that recognition and memorability. And the algorithm will actually show carousels to your audience multiple times. If they don't swipe past that first slide, it will show the post again on the second slide. So again, it's really great for that visibility and reach through the algorithm. I've seen that where I go back and I see the next slide that I didn't look at before. On my surfing Instagram channel, I put multiple pictures of the same thing from different angles and stuff and and people will swipe through all of those it seems like the platform is really encouraging me to try and turn that into a reel (laughs) um it's trying to turn everything into a reel i've yeah even i get those notifications i'm like i really don't think this will work instagram but you're clearly trying to tell me something um yeah you can do similar content that you would sort of use in a carousel in a reels format Obviously, it's ideal that there's actual footage, not still images in a reel. And a lot of people panic and think, oh, if I need to film a reel, it needs to be me dancing, you know, whatever it might be. And and that was that was me. That's TikTok, isn't it? I thought TikTok's the dancing one. And that's that's TikTok. And and even for me, like that's personally my, you know, way of creating. I love movement and, and being in front of the camera. But if that's not you, it doesn't have to be this huge production. Um, it can still have a big focus on the text and the actual messaging in the reel without, you know, a full song and dance every single time you need to create one. I mean, I've seen a lot of a lot of those videos get shared millions of times, lip syncing and and fun. But then I see this this maybe not a lot of buyer intent. You know, the things that I share with my wife that I think are funny. I'm not buying anything from these people. I, I don't even know what the account is, but I just I want to share something that's fun or interesting or hilarious, you know, or that has some private context that we think is is funny because we had, you know, it mimics a situation that came up in our life or whatever. But then we get to accounts like mine. I don't have many followers, right? I, I've never been tempted to go and buy followers. Most coaches or people online I know, when I ask them, how did you get 25,000 people? They say, oh, I just bought it. And I'm wondering if you could just speak to that for a moment because if you're on Instagram for any number of months you will be approached in your inbox on multiple occasions saying hey we can get you this exposure we can they put you in giveaways or they get bots to follow you or whatever is this should this be strongly discouraged oh it's possibly the most detrimental thing you could do to your instagram business and it's similar to as if you bought email subscribers or just anything i always try to 
picture it this way. You have a theater, you're on the stage. And if you were inviting people into your audience, obviously the people you want to come into the theater and take a seat are the people that are going to be ideal clients or, you know, customers that are very likely to actually invest and spend money with you. If you just flung open the doors and said, anyone and everyone come in, just walk into the theater, take a seat. And then the time came for you on the stage to do your pitch, talk about your offer, whatever it is. A lot of those people are going to ignore you, not be interested and very likely walk back out the door very quickly. Or, you know, since they're not even real followers, they're not even going to be. They're like cardboard cutouts. Like, yeah. (laughs) So literally the the only person that uh, you're tricking is you. You're just like talking to an auditorium full of. But I suppose what's working for these people is they think, well, other people are going to look into this theatre and see that it's packed. So they'll think that I'm special or, or have more authority. Is there some of that effect, the halo effect of the appearance of vanity metrics? Yeah, there's a lot of validity, I think, or fake validity in having a big following and it feels like you're more established, you're well-trusted. And I don't think that's ever really going to go away. I think, unfortunately, that's a very normal part of social media comparison, all that sort of stuff. But when you really think about it, it's and it's very obvious when someone does have that fake following. If you go into their posts, they've got no comments, they've got very low views. And not to say that that's important, but you know, it's obviously not really doing anything for them except that initial first glance when you look at their profile and you see 25,000 followers. But after that, it doesn't really have a lot of substance to it. Well, I saw a guy with 800,000 followers, and but he has like 20 comments on his posts and 19 of them are people pitching a work home offer as a, as a bot, right? And I think something's not right here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I guess it's a red flag. All right. So moving on from, from that, I've been actually happy with my small audience. They do actually comment and respond and they actually buy, which is really what I want them to do, uh, you know, obviously, apart from my surf channel where I really do enjoy creating the content. I like, sur- I like filming surf equipment and I like sharing clips and I like it when the shapers see their products and I know they're going to feel good and so that brings me joy. For the business content, uh, you know, we're cutting up short clips and so forth. There was this period a few months back where most of the clips we were doing would get 11 or 8,000 or 15,000 views. And now sometimes we get 500 or 1,500, but I wouldn't say they're any worse or whatever. Does the algorithm do weird things and and have flurries like that and then pull back? Have I broken something or or what? (laughs) Everyone thinks they've broken something. I've definitely noticed a change in especially with reels, um, you know, engagement and, and views. Um, and it really, and it's the same type of content I've been sharing um, for a long time. That used to be what really propelled my business forward. There's a lot of factors. It can be time of year with what else is going on. Like a lot of people will notice big changes around um, if it's summer in the US, engagement and reach always drops. Um, and then of course we come into Black Friday, Christmas, when you're competing with a lot of paid advertising campaigns. But market interest and audience consumer behavior, just especially on Instagram, really fluctuates. What people are interested in is always changing. And that's why Instagram in general is one big experiment. You really can't, you know, if something's working for you right now, if something worked for you in 2022, it's probably not going to be the same thing that's working in 2023. So you can still take the aspects of what was working in those previous reels. And maybe it's just making a few tweaks to how it's presented. Um, changing the format slightly. It still can be all the same content. Just the way we consume things really changes in a second on Instagram. So just kind of, yeah, looking at the data and being like, okay, what worked about this, but how can we maybe optimize it, change it and refresh it to be delivered again in a better way? Yeah, I can really relate to that. I mean, I think I was too early with my videos because I was pretty early to to follow Gary V. you know, a long time ago. I'm talking about 15 years ago. And there was no reels or shorts. I mean, YouTube was brand new and, and I would make content and, and we would put it on my blog. Back then, we'd get like 200 comments on a blog post and people would share the blog post. That was where the content lived. And then the platforms made it easier and easier to publish. The, the internet speeds got faster and faster. And um, I started out with IGTV, but it wasn't really what it was. But reels, just you know, it was phenomenal for me when I'll get you know, thousands of people looking in a little video and it makes me 
excited about that platform. I actually prefer video and and talking than than typing. Right? I'm not a wordsmith by any stretch. I do have a team, and I'd love to talk about that because I get inundated every single day with people pitching me short video services and social media services. That someone's teaching this because it's almost exactly the same script. It's a compliment about your channel. Love the great stuff you're putting out, and I want to chat to you. Well, it was just me. I thought I was really special. No, it's, it's, it's yeah, no, you're not. Unfortunately, uh, I think I think it's uh, some kind of compliment or flattery thing. I don't know whether it's Hormosi or someone else has taught people to to start off the bat with a compliment, let people feel happy to hear from you, and ask for permission to talk to them. And sometimes they offer to do it uh, a video, or sometimes they just make the video, which I would recommend people do anyway. And they were pretty much promising the same thing and showing some some samples. But there is a prolification of this industry of people prepared to do stuff. Now, at the moment, my team do this in-house. And we didn't start out as video creators or social media experts, but we're just, you know, we do courses, we learn from stuff. And it sounds like we should be learning from you as well. I, I believe you've got a course on this stuff. I do. So... We do it in-house and I do my bit and they do their bit and we put it up and then we learn together. And sometimes we bring in consultants or experts to help us learn new things. And recently we changed our style. We went from doing the Hormosi style to having simpler, uh, a simpler style, less, you know, pew, pew, pew stuff and less, less fluoro lights and flashy stuff because my audience... I think they appreciate a more direct approach. And when I look at your channel, I, you know, I see a lot of beige and clean style and, and stuff. So you have your own style. How do we identify the best way to come up with a style and to incorporate a team, especially if you're listening to this and you don't have a team, what are our options? Mm. Well, as far as style goes, I always think, especially if you're kind of initially starting with this on your own, Definitely lock in something and experiment with it for a while. I see a lot of people experimenting with their branding as in changing it every single week for a long time. And not only is that a massive, you know, time-wasting activity to be fussing over colors and fonts and things, it's, you're just never going to actually establish any type of presence that people remember. So whether you DIY it, whether you get someone professionally, just do it, lock it in test it for a while. If you need to refine it, change it over time, that's totally normal. As far as then incorporating team to your social media, especially like personal brands, people that are the authority and leader in their space, exactly what you said. I love that you said you do your thing, they do their thing, you come together and you work out how to how to move forward, continue to improve. You can't grab a team and expect them to run the show for you and like even I say it all the time, even Kim Kardashian has to go and film her own content. She might have, you know, a team of experts, everyone in the world working for her, but she's still going to take the photo. She's still going to record the interview. And they are going to be able to support you in keeping consistent, maintaining that look. Um, but you really have to be the driving force behind it, especially if you want to build up that, yeah, like I said, authority. They People want to hear your voice. They want to, you know, hear what you have to say. As far as video editing and all that sort of stuff, I've recently been doing way more testing, literally posting even the same video um, with slightly different text, edited in a different way, posting them at the exact same time. And I asked my audience, which video did you see first? Which one compelled you to watch it for longer? So yeah, it's a really long experiment that never really ends. And as a social media manager working for businesses, the, the people that were most successful when I worked with them were the ones that stayed involved, um, stayed productive and and interested in the process obviously allowed me to do my thing and trusted my expertise but showed up and actually got involved in the process of content creation on an ongoing basis yeah that's really interesting so do you still consult how do you work with people so I have a it's sort of a hybrid program it's a self-paced online course but there are group coaching elements um, and that is my main flagship program for people to work through my curriculum um, and essentially they're learning how to DIY um, their socials to hopefully get them to a place where if they do want to outsource they've 
got a, the, you know their revenue up, their sales are coming in, they're confidently creating content on their own. And then when the time comes to maybe it's a VA initially, maybe it's a social media manager, maybe eventually it's a marketing manager can come in and take over, but they still have that camera confidence. They understand how to put together content concepts that are going to be engaging for their audience. Because at the end of the day, no one knows your audience like you do and is going to be able to articulate what their desires, dreams, pain points, all of that is better than you are. Yeah, this is a recurring theme I've heard from copywriters as well. They say like you're the best person to write your copy, but it's really good to get help and polish. Our mutual friend Stevie Dillon, she says you're the gun at this. And she was, Stevie says, social, like she knows about social. So that's a huge compliment. For your course, does that mean you have to update modules from time to time when you see a shift in the way that the platforms are working? Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the foundational aspects of marketing concepts, um, even video structure and all that sort of stuff stays very similar. Um, but I do like to jump in there, update things as they change. Luckily, things have slowed down in terms of updates. Um, there was a bit of a chaotic roller coaster there where every week it felt like something was new. But, you know, that is kind of the magic of Instagram. They 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 make things in they always, it, I have to always remind my audience of this, Instagram make changes and updates in favor of the consumer, not in favor of the business owner and content creator. So you kind of got to remember that they're making these choices based on what their audience is asking for. And you would do the same thing as a business. So take it as a new opportunity and not a burden or thing you have to learn, just a new exciting opportunity that could be the new thing like Reels was for you, the new thing that really moves your business forward. Yeah, well, I would say they probably do things in self-interest, which is making it good for the consumer because the consumer is the product that they're monetizing with, with their ads. And I mean, I talk about this phrase, own the race course. We have to keep in mind when we're playing on someone else's platform, they're going to change the rules and it, it may not suit us. And I do see from time to time people get um, banned or, or cancelled out. How important is thing, are things like the blue tick these days? Well, the blue tick definitely has kind of its perception around it has changed. Now, essentially, you can pay for it. When verification and the blue tick came out, it was really to avoid celebrities and public figures getting confused with fake accounts. That really was the basic premise of it. Now, it is essentially, I see it as insurance for your Instagram or your meta accounts because you can have it for Facebook as well. Um, if you feel, you know, this community audience you've built up, like you were saying, on a borrowed platform is is important to you and an essential component of your business, then that insurance is probably very important. Um, having close access to the support from Meta can be really important if you are ever hacked, um, if you have issues with, you know, advertising spend. Um, for the right business, it definitely makes a lot of sense. For example, me, I have it. Um, I need to talk to Meta quite frequently. But yeah, it's not going to be essential for everyone and it definitely is not essential. But if it works for your business, works for your budget, it can be great. I'm sure the the people that don't know about it would probably see the blue tick on your account and be like, oh, wow, that's quite good. And that would be a whole lot better than buying the fake followers <laughs> if you had to pick. Well, I do have the blue tick, but it was, it was mainly because there was just a prolification of people replicating my account and stealing my images and then offering free Bitcoin as comments under my actual account. Yes, if you're impersonating. Yeah, the impersonation thing is, it was out of control. Um, so that was one reason why I th thought it might be helpful. And I think the platform seems to be favoring having real people as their product. But I do have a question around this um, next topic, which is filtering and, and cancelling. One thing that during the pandemic and, and COVID, you know, all of our the fear factor went up and the there was, I believe, a lot, you know, a lot of criminal activity by governments and big pharma. I, I was really outraged at the controls that were put in place and the mandates that came through and I had strong opinions about it but I actually suppressed some of those because at the end of the day I need the money to keep rolling in and I don't want to be cancelled and to have that income stopped just because at the time you were very harshly penalised if you spoke about things that you saw that weren't sitting well with you that have I'm going to say now three years later a lot of those things have proven to be fairly accurate. Uh, and, you know, I, st I still think we're in a crossover period where we can't quite talk about it all as much as we want, but it seems like we're getting closer. 
Um, poor old Russell Brand, you know, he seems to be getting flogged right now for past uh, bad behaviour, but, you know, through a definite coordinated campaign of suppression. And, and it seems like governments, especially uh, the Canadian government, are very keen to censor private media streams. And as a podcaster, uh, like they would want you to register with them if you reach a certain size and revenue or whatever, and, and they want to be able to control and suppress independence. So I'm concerned about that. How open should we be about our true feelings and how worried about being cancelled should we be? And I'm, I'm not even talking about things that should be that edgy. But, I mean, it, it was actually at some point it was really um, you would have been uh, against the narrative if you were to say to people, hey, you shouldn't be mandated to have to take an injection to be able to work in a job. That At some point you might have got cancelled for saying something like that. Yes, well, I think um, as consumers, we are more researchy than ever before and we want to know who we're buying from. We want to know who we follow, especially because Instagram, we do open up a lot of our lives beyond the business. The advice I always try to give is, is share what feels right to you through the lens of your business. If a topic that potentially is more, you know, controversial, um, you know, topical, as long as it's making sense for your business, it's making sense for your audience. Um, obviously, they're going to be people that aren't on board, that it isn't for them. They're going to make their choice to stay or go. And that's totally fine. It's your platform. You can do with it what you will. I think as long as everything always is circling back to the audience dynamic and culture that you're wanting to cultivate, it's it's really at your discretion what, what it is that you want to share. Um, I don't know too much about you know, what is allowed what is not allowed in the deep depth darks of the internet. But <laughs> as far as Instagram, um, there are very clear community guidelines. So if you're ever unsure, um, you don't want to risk your account being uh, taken down. You can always check your, your account status. Um, if any of your content has gone against the guidelines, they've been really great at making that more transparent and easy because all of that, you know, confusion around is my account blocked? Are they hiding my content? That caused a big stir and made a lot of business owners specifically upset as we do use the platform to promote our businesses. So yeah, talk about what you feel is right for your business, is right for your audience, and just always consult the community guidelines because they've made that really clear now. One of the ones that shocked me was um, the Gold Coast um, fitness influencer, Adam Sullivan. I'm not sure if you're aware of his account, Evidence-Based Training. Oh, yes. I know him through that name. Yep. Like every single post, he uses a, a four-letter word that can be deemed offensive to particular audiences. But um, seems like it's not an issue for Instagram. And it most definitely has caused him to have a shareable reputation. I'm talking about him right now. Right? Yes. Yes. I love his account because he's so polarizing and he actually teaches one thing over and over and over and over and over again. And, and it, it taught me something about um, because I was interested in fitness as I've encountered his account, he talks about calorie deficit, right? That's his whole point. Every single post is related to calorie deficit, but he comes up with a thousand different ways to make it interesting with the way that he performs it or expresses it. Personally, I don't love that he uses that swear word in every post, but I was absolutely intrigued and fascinated that it's allowed and that it, it's it's really his hook. And I actually think he might outgrow it at some point when he grows up, I mean, 10 years from now or 20 years from now when he's my age, he might look back and think, well, that was a bit sensational at the time. I, I don't know. But it, it really fascinates me. That's the sort of an example of someone who I think has really worked the algorithm well in his favour. And I'm wondering if you've got any favourite accounts that you look to for inspiration or you think doing a particularly good job on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Funny you said that about that fitness account because I have a very similar account who I'm personally not a massive fan, but my partner is and someone that he follows is James Smith. I knew you were going to say it. I knew it because they're all the same. That's a similar <laughs> thing and maybe he uses that word a little bit less, probably uses other words, but just so solid. Again, I don't even think I follow him. I think he just comes up based on recommendations, but so solid in what he's trying to achieve and teach. And it's, again, like you said, the same message, 
just repackaged in a hundred different. And it is that literally the exact same message as Adam Sullivan. They they he teaches calorie deficit as well, and he comes up with very interesting ways to do it. And he's obviously had a big breakout on YouTube as well. And if you look back at their old content, it was pretty unremarkable and pretty ordinary. So it's very inspirational in terms of how they evolved. And so I put them up there as benchmarks, as best practice, not saying we should come up with something that edgy. But what um, Smith did was he basically, he made a reputation out of tearing down bad advice. And, you know, even he got a bit worn out of that genre. But it definitely gets the eyeballs and it gets the views and he's he's really taken that. And like all good fitness trainers, he's moved into the business market. <laughs> they become business market coaches. Like Hormos, he's another one. From They go fit pro to business. They go mainstream, right? And that's just the evolution. Uh, it'd be really interesting to see where they end up. But so you've got a similar, basically, yeah, I, I follow that too. And as I'm evolving my camera work and what we allow to to go through on edits i hold them up as examples of hey we've got a lot of runway here that we're not utilizing where my team have actually been editing me out a lot on podcasts to clean me up because they're all very very nice all good people my team but they've been packaging me a little more conservatively than the raw cut and so we've loosened that up lately and i've my audience have noticed that and i get more comments and and also it appears they want to go behind the scenes more. They want, to, they want to see me outside of the business environment. They want to see me outside of the library here. They want to see me with the surfboard or they want to see, you know, want to hear my thoughts when, uh, you know, when I got stuck overseas last week. They were responsive to my stories showing, you know, Philippine Airlines. They sent me this great email. It's like, um, so my wife and I and my daughter were set to fly and they cancelled our flight. The day before, they'd upgraded me to business class, took my money, and the next day we cancelled your flight. Your wife and daughter are on tomorrow's flight and you're on a flight next Friday. Oh, my God. And they didn't want to know about fixing that. And do you know what the, the email said? Um, it was like a, a minor reschedule or something. It was some, some like really tried to water it down. I'm like, this is... This is this, major. <laughs> this, this is actually more significant than what you might think. So I uh, ended up having to cancel that flight and I rebooked with Qantas and I went to a different city and ended up in a roundabout way. We all ended up in Brisbane at around within an hour and a half of each other, miraculously, at a huge expense. But like I say, you know, like a, a problem that can be solved with money is not really a big problem. But it was um, I could see that my audience were feeling that they were they were sharing the frustration and the experience of you know it was like oh, philippine airlines think this is minor and then Qantas comes in to save the day although i read on the news today that they've canceled 50 flights at Qantas because the pilots have walked off the job so i think it was just a bit of russian roulette there i will say that if you are traveling right now and and you can relate to this having been bumped off your cruise ship during mid-covid um it's not quite there yet they haven't quite settled down yet there's a lot of a lot of cancellations and chaos but it, it was interesting to see that my audience want to connect with me deeper and they'd like I think they'd like to see the more unfiltered me and I'm making an effort to share that more. People just just are nosy people. We we <laughs> I mean it's why it's why there was the rise of influencers. Like there was we have celebrities, right? And we don't have a lot of access to them. And then celebrity uh, sorry, influencers sort of with the next thing. And it's why they grew to such fame because they were so open. So then you have business owners who choose to kind of peel back the layers of their business and, and inject a little bit of their, you know, personal life as well. And I feel like that's where the gold is because, you know, no offense to influencers, but some of them are business owners, but a business owner that you can really get to know, feel like you can follow the journey with, and then they also provide you incredible value on, you know, in their actual business. I feel like that's the real jackpot. And in terms of the people I really follow and in, are engaged by other people that have that incredible value and knowledge to share. But I, I feel like I know 
them through the energy that they put out there, the real rawness through their content. Um, I love sharing all the mistakes. Like I generally will post like a blooper reel of, of reels mistakes, you know, a few times a year. I share the stories that I mumble and fumble through the words um, because that's real and everyone's doing the same thing. And I actually started doing these weekend recaps on stories as well, probably almost two years ago, thinking no one would watch them probably except my parents. And my parents still do watch them. But the amount of people that that starts conversations with, even across the world that have never been to this restaurant that I went to, and it's not even really about me trying to actively get people to care about my life, but it just gives them that little bit of window into what I'm doing, um, how they can get to know me more, those little points of connection, um, especially when you have a broader, you know, worldwide audience, just letting them see the real you because it's the same you that's going to be on the Zoom coaching call or at the event. And people love to have that real experience. Well, I'll tell you what, one person who wasn't happy when I started sharing a little bit more was my mum. <laughs> she called me up. Uh, she was upset about something that I said in a podcast. And it wasn't anything that wasn't in my book, right? I, I actually I literally wrote it in my book six years ago and I gave them a draft of the book to, to ask them about it and we got to a point where they were happy for me to share that. And I just basically rehashed a story that, that uh, but she wasn't excited about it. And I'm like, so that was, that's the first barbed wire that I tripped over as I'm starting to share more. Like I've upset someone and it happens to be my mum. You'll learn. <laughs> so who'll learn, me or her? Well, you'll learn as you start to kind yeah, of Yeah, like I said, I won't talk about it again. It's okay, mum. She probably wouldn't even want me talking about this. But it happens. So it's like I want to share what the reality of this is. This is what happens in life. Things aren't perfect. They don't always fall in, in perfect order. And it's hard to know where the line is and what to share, what to not share. I'll tell you what I won't share. I don't share my kids except like in the YouTube video that we just made, my daughter ran out during shooting and ran off again, but we just left it in because that happened, right? And and my team do leave in ums and ahs and fumbles now, but I think because I came from Mercedes-Benz, we were used to polishing things and just, you know, it had to be just right. You, you hand over a car to someone, they had to be flawless. And so I ended up showing the perfect version of me and now we've just walked it back a bit to the slightly less edited version which is actually the real version of me because I'm I don't make that many mistakes because I've done so many podcast episodes and I'm pretty comfortable talking but we do just leave the stuff in there that's there and like in one of the podcasts I did recently my friend had a cold caller come to the the door during the podcast and we left it in because it happened and it, you know it's real character yeah oh i think people are craving more of the realness because like you're just saying it happens to them too and when we try to paint this picture of perfection very polished um what can happen is when they uh, you know maybe they meet you in real life or they get on that coaching call with you and you're a little bit more you know loose and you know you're being more yourself they go oh you know this is the real them and I bet a lot of people would say a lot about a lot of business owners you know just you know why aren't you like that in your content what you know why don't you just be like you in your content and I think that's like the permission slip we need to give ourselves is just be the same you that's in your business because that's what people are getting and buying. And there's no point having this facade. Um, it's going to be hard for you to maintain a facade ongoing. Um, and then people will be a little bit surprised. Hopefully it's a good surprise when they meet you and it's a an enjoyable experience. But if you can bring that to your content, people are going to trust you faster, get to know you faster and hopefully spend faster. <laughs> Well, I think I, I think I'm the same person in all modalities, but I think that's the part where you have to work closely with the team and let them know what what you want. That it's okay to just to let it go through. Where we might have in the past cleaned it up. Yeah. And like you said in the beginning, when you started your business, where we want to appear bigger than we really are, and we there's a lady in our local community. She's she got her business cards, and she's and I said, well, where are you going to put the business cards, and what do you actually help people with? Because her business card just said that she's a mindset coach I'm like great but so who do you help and what can they benefit from from you with like what what outcome could they expect maybe lead with that or give them a free session or something that's actually interesting to them if you're going to leave it sitting there in shops um, and but so we do start out with the way in business but it's important to reassess as we go I, I promise that you go soon but I do have a question about broad versus niche because 
guys like Ryan Megan, who I think might have been responsible for the starting point of the the Hormosi style videos, you know, he's often sitting there with his little microphone and he teaches people to pick really broad topics that would be interesting to your audience. And so he says things like cars, things like high end fashion or whatever, they have such a broad appeal. That's how you're going to get your big viral videos that bring people to your account. And then you can go more niche with the other content. What do you think about that? I mean, I definitely agree with that in a sense. And I think I agree with also niching down. I think every business is actually going to be really different. I know for me, I was just like, I do social media. And then it was kind of a process of like, I'm going to just find out what people want. And then that's what I'm going to not even niche down to, but focus on. And then I continually like, I'm always gathering intel. I'm like, okay, what do these people want? Who are the kind of clients that I keep seeming to attract? Maybe that's what's working for me. So I definitely went broad and niche down. For some people, for clarity, they really need to like be super clear and, you know, granular on what it is they're talking about and offering and doing. But I really think it's, it's like you were saying, it's the, it's the outcome. What are you actually helping people do that you can kind of identify first and then work backwards and be like, okay, who are these people? It really can go either way. Um, I know for me, I'm definitely someone that likes being a little bit more broad with my top of funnel content. That's the strategy that I recommend and teach is to, you know, increase your visibility, get eyes on your business, then bring them through the funnel with the rest of your content to nurture them. Um, And that content's going to be very different to that top of funnel content. And that's when you're weeding out people, getting them out of your theater if they're not the right fit or making them take a seat if they're the right fit. So when the time comes to sell, pitch to them, you've got that really clear audience whether they're you know all the same type of person or they're a little bit different they're there because they want the outcome that you can deliver on nice and should we be posting a lot of content or just like only a few times but really high quality i'm a i'm a quality over quantity person um i'm personally a three to four times a week kind of person i'm not an everyday well there's three to three times a day type people as well you know yes um And definitely when you are looking at other Instagram specialists and social media specialists, like we live our lives on Instagram. So it's very easy for me to post more, share more, be on Instagram in general more. But, you you know, you're probably with clients all day running your business. You've got a family as well, whatever it might be for you. Like you've kind of got to work out, okay, I want, you know, this is my goal when it comes to my purpose for being on Instagram, my intent what do I need to do in order to reach that goal is three posts a week that are actually specifically and strategically designed to actually help me achieve that goal going to be enough or do I need to increase it even more and then do I have the bandwidth do I have the team do I have the resources do I have even like the interest to post 10 reels a week because I know for me that would not even be fun (laughs) yeah I can imagine now there's one more topic that people are going to be curious about because they always ask every time equipment what do we need to film this do do we need to hire a crew do we need to have a dslr camera can we do it on our iphone do we do it with a a computer a laptop or whatever and i've got a burning question i have to know because i've seen all the cool kids do it i've seen you with one of these sort of microphones are we are we clipping on or are we holding it like a mini news reporter which is what i see them all doing they all hold these little microphones like a little mini news reporter Here's mine. Yeah, um, you hold it, don't you? I hold it, um, mostly because this is a not very high quality Amazon one. And as soon as I put it on my shirt, and I like to talk with my hands a little bit. It's rustling, is it? It's yeah. not very good. If you had a high, like the road ones, they're really good. <laughs> I got them all. Don't worry. I got the, these ones came yesterday. They're $69 on Amazon and they're actually really good. And they plug plug straight into the iPhone. Um and the case charges itself. I, I'm pretty impressed because I've got the Rode Go and I've got the, the lav mics and I've got all of them. And this one's actually by far the easiest to travel with and the simplest. And my friend Zach Mason had this on our Maldives trip. He recorded a plane video. He, he gains on planes or something and it actually masked out the aeroplane noise. That's impressive from a $69 uh, unit. People are going to ask. I, I um, initially got it for a sound thing because I was living my, where my office was, was on a busy road, got it for sound, tried it on my shirt. It was too rustly and then did it in my hand. Um, and it, it really does come from the TikTok style of 
holding up your I've mic. seen, you know, Ryan does it. All, the young kids interviewing on the street, they always hold it. So it's okay to do is what I wanted to know. It's a trendy thing. It's a sound quality thing. It's, yeah, I like to use it for both reasons. Um, people In front always, camera or back camera? Oh, um, I generally use the front camera just because I don't trust I've got my shot set up right most of the time. I'm a one-man person, uh, one-man band. So um, I still use just an iPhone, my Amazon mic and a tripod and I get by really well. <laughs> That's what we want to hear. We want to hear that it, it, there's no barrier to this. No, absolutely. Brittany, you've been so uh, resourceful with all this information. I've, I feel like I've been able to ask some of the questions I've had about social media because I'm, you know, Instagram is my favorite app to use as a consumer. I love my surf content. And I love my personal brand. It's it was so good to ditch the old company account and just to lean into it more personally. And I feel like we've covered a lot of the important things. Um, I know you've got a course there. I heard that you run that course on the Click platform, KLEQ. I do. I love it. it. Yeah, it was, I didn't, um, I've never used anything else what I dived into first. Um, and I'm so grateful I did. You you do. I don't think you realize how lucky that was. (laughs) Yeah, I absolutely love it. My students love it. Um, and I'm excited for what's, you know, still to come with it all as well. Nice. And you're at the social Britify.com. You want to go and check out your stuff and obviously you're on Instagram, so we should follow you and, uh, and learn from you as well. Um, and we've just covered so much ground. I, I really appreciate you sharing. I'll be enjoying watching your account grow and hopefully you'll see some changes in mind too as a result of today's show. Thanks, James. Thanks for having me. Awesome. There we go. That's episode 1037. We'll put up the show notes and links off to Brittany's site. And uh, yeah, great episode. This is James Schramko. 